All right, everybody, welcome once again to the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast, helping you maximize your potential with minimalist approaches to diet and exercise. Coming to you live here on the RDP YouTube channel, where we talk about our topic of the day, or the week in this case, which is the top five commandments for helping you build muscle with calisthenics. This is part one of the two-part series of the 10 commandments for building muscle, fresh out of Paul Wade's book, CMAS. Now this list is something that I like to review on uh, several times a year. The reason for that is because when it comes to building muscle, it's not down to simple things like just do this rep range or do this exercise or do this program. There's a lot of pieces that need to be in play for you to stand even a ghost of a chance of building any sort of muscle and strength. And as we'll explore, even if you've got nine out of these 10 things, if you're missing just one of them, it can compromise the entire thing. So I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth than they go into the book, but if you're interested in learning more about this, check out Paul Waite's book, CMAS, the link is down below in the description. So this is uh, the first five of the 10, and I'm gonna give my own little notes and everything like that. Then we'll go into our live Q&A. So, all right, without further ado, let's jump right in. Commandment number one, I got them here on my phone. What do you need to do to build muscle with calisthenics? Commandment number one, embrace repetitions. And Paul Wade talks about this one specifically because at the time he wrote this book, and still to this today in a, in a degree, a lot of people approach calisthenics more from a skillful building aspect. Now, of course, you can build muscle and skill at the same time. They are very much synonymous with another. But a lot of times what people end up doing is they'll practice something for a couple of reps or for a short period of time, like holding an elbow lever or getting one or two muscle ups that are kind of shaky. And then they'll get to a decent amount of little bit of fatigue. But as soon as their ability to do the skill starts to be compromised, they stop and they rest. And so they don't really push their muscles all that hard from a fatigue standpoint. And that's great when you wanna practice a skill, it's grease the groove, you wanna be relatively fresh so you can practice it as well as possible. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that when we are trying to build muscle, we're trying to basically grind the muscle right into the ground. Just reps, reps, reps. When it starts burning, you keep on grinding like crazy. And you can build muscle along a very big rep repetition range. Now, the old school way of thinking is stay within this narrow range, like eight to 12 or something. These days, the science is really suggesting that you can do it anywhere from like 30% of your one rep max all the way up to super heavy loads and everywhere in between, as long as you're pushing your muscles really hard. Now, there's more information that we got to pay attention to this, though, because we want to embrace reps, which means practices and methods that compromise your ability to just grind out reps are probably not the most productive for you. Uh, case in point, I mentioned like the focus on quote skill work, right? So as your ability to do repetitions decreases, you can't really push the muscles all that hard. So it's not gonna be the most productive way. Sure, you can build muscle, but it's not quite the best. Also, when it comes to exercises is things that have an emphasis on things other than pushing the muscle really hard. And this is one of the reasons why in grind style calisthenics that we have an emphasis on single leg training, but with upper body support. So if you're doing things like churn squats, pistol squats and stuff, you're kind of balancing and whoa, no, or your mobility is really compromised, or that's the main challenging thing. You can't really push your muscles all that hard because your ability to continue doing reps is limited by another factor. It's limited by your cardio, it's limited by your stability, it's limited by your skill. When you're hitting the limits of these other factors, your ability to do the necessary reps is compromised. Therefore, so is your ability to grind into the fatigue into the muscle and therefore stimulate some muscle mass. So embrace reps and embrace methods that allow you to get reps relatively comfortably with a lower emphasis on skill. That's why grind style calisthenics is low skill, high strength and muscular uh, work capacity. All right, commandment number two, work hard. And I know it's kind of like, well, duh. it's like, no, no, no. Here's the thing is sometimes when it comes to uh, strength training, I see guys all the time, even in the gym, because all these commandments apply just as well to building muscle with strength, with uh, weights as it does calisthenics, as it really is exactly the same. And guys will just be kind of like going through the motions. 
and they're watching things on their phone and they're goofing around with their friends and stuff. The thing is the level of work necessary for the muscle to really stimulate a hypertrophic response is usually a hell of a lot harder than we often realize. It should be pushing ourselves to a level that we're almost kind of a little scared before we do the set. Sometimes when I'm working with somebody and they're under a weight or they're going to do a like archer push-ups or something and they're kind of like kind of intimidated like oh boy this is really going to hurt I just you know got to get my head in the game. Now we know we're in the right realm of things. Back when I was a bike racer I always knew a bike race was going to be effective for really pushing me hard if I was on that starting line. I'm like I'm not nervous about the race. I'm actually kind of scared for how hard this is going to be, how hard this is gonna push my mind and body. That's what we wanna do, is really push ourselves to a very high level. Now, I know a lot of people will look at that and be like, well, in convict conditioning, Coach Wade says don't go to failure. And I think in that regard, uh, what Coach Wade talks about failure is way different than what people usually regard as failure. Because again, a lot of times our failure is the failure of our endurance or our work capacity or the skill or a million other things. It's not the actual muscular failure that we're running into. And that's why I always tell people, don't worry about like stay away from failure kind of advice because most of us never really get really that deep into failure to begin with. We're not that strong up here. You have to have a real in-depth gun to the head mentality to push yourself that far. In fact, I've had several coaches tell me it's impossible to do on your own, that you have to have a coach and someone literally screaming bloody murder in your face to get to that level. Like you cannot do it on your own. And of course, that's, you know, we're trying to sell personal training and stuff, but I really do believe because we push ourselves harder when someone else is pushing us. We just will not push ourselves to that level on our own. Now, does this mean you have to train with someone else in order to push that hard? No, but it does take experience. It does take practice and it doesn't hurt if you have a training buddy. So that's why I always say, just go as hard as possible, as hard as you can, keeping the comp keeping the uh, technical uh, proficiency of your technique. So don't compromise your technique and your safety uh, at the expense of these things, of course, but just push as hard as you can. We can always push harder than we think. That's number two. Numero three here. All right. Use simple compound exercises. So this goes along with what I was saying earlier, right? We want the skill requirements of our exercise to be low. We don't want to feel like we're challenging our coordination and our endurance, like cardio endurance and stability and balance and a hundred of the, these other things, right? We basically want the muscle to be the weak link in the exercise that we're doing. Everything else is not being that challenge. So that way we're ensuring we're really punishing the hell out of the muscle, or I should say really stimulating the muscle. So the best way to do that, simple, simple, simple compound movements, push, pull and squat. Those are your bread and butter movements, okay? Full body extension and flexion and any kind of lateral motion, carries, twisting motions. Those are the things that we want to really focus on. And that's why another reason why building muscle with calisthenics or weight machines or free weights and stuff really isn't all that different from one or the other because the movement patterns are pretty much exactly the same. Horizontal push, horizontal pull, vertical push and pull, right? Squatting motions, hip hinges. There's only so many basic compound movements that the human body has, and they're basically the same across all various methods. So focusing on those simple compound movements ensures we're working a lot of muscle, we're working it in a synergistic way, we're getting a lot of resistance through the body, okay? And we also have low skill, but high demand on the muscle, which is like the formula that we want for our best muscle building exercises. So use simple compound exercises. Number four, and this is commandment number four of five that we're talking about today. And again, for those who are just joining on the live feed, this is from Coach Wade Muscle with Calisthenics, but this applies to all disciplines and methods. And we'll be covering the second five uh, next week. But if you want to learn more about CMAS, the link is down below. But anyway, uh, number four, co commandment four is limit your sets. Now, this is one that Coach Wade is notorious on, is having a lot of intensity, pour a lot of effort into your sets. But if you have this large number of set uh, approach, where you're doing seven, eight, nine large, large amounts of volume, one of two things happen. 
you're going to pour a lot of effort into a couple of sets and the rest of the sets are going to be crap or you're going to pace yourself and not push that hard compromising uh, uh, commandment number two of working hard you don't really push or work that hard so your entire workout ends up being this meh kind of level of intensity you want to really push it very hard now in many of Paul Wade's books he talks about going with about two sets and the reason is because it's kind of like you can get a lot from one but two now these are two work sets these don't include warm-up sets and I'm right on a point with Paul Wade on this one because for the most part, you're only going to get two, maybe at the most, three good work sets in a, in a workout. Everything else is kind of ramping up to that or hanging on for dear life and just grinding out reps in an effort to get more volume. So when you really push and work yourself and get down to it honestly, you're only going to have a couple of good, honest, hard work sets in a workout per exercise uh, that you're using. Now, in CMAS, Paul has several workout kind of examples where he's changing exercises for tension chains. And that's kind of like you're using a finisher and pushing yourself and you're kind of changing gears and that's a little different. So if you're doing like pull-ups and then you go with like finishing off with rows, like in a grind style calisthenics workout, that's a little bit different. But keeping in mind that the bulk of your workout is going to come from just a couple of sets. You don't want to sit down to your workout and be like, I've got to do five sets or what have you. But you remember from what I was telling you last week too, is I'm not a big fan of placing a strict number of sets you should be doing. I'm not going to tell you do two because if you're still ramping up at the end of that second one and your nervous system and your metabolism is still ramping up, you haven't gotten those two money sets that's really going to create a lot for you. So you're, you're still not there yet. Keep going. But at the same time, I'm not going to say do six because if you're spent after three, those other ones are just going to spend more energy and uh, require more recovery. So that's why my approach is always do the sets necessary. Get in, kind of let yourself ramp up. But once you start feeling like you're hitting on all eight cylinders, you're going to get to this point where you're like, it's go time, baby. Like, let's go. In that case, pour everything you've got into that next set and then pour everything you have into that second one. That third one should be like, pew, you should be really, really starting to feel like you just don't have much left in the tank come that third or fourth set. If you're still ramping up, you're not there yet. So I would change this commandment a little bit to say not so much limit sets, but look for those two, maybe three sets that are the, the real golden sets. And just once you get those, you're done. You know, if it takes you several sets to get there, so be it. But once you have them, you're done. Don't feel like you have to get a large number of sets to make something happen. And finally, commandment numero five, right, is a focus on progress. And utilize a training journal. Coach Wade is always about utilizing that training journal. And the reason is simple because when you work out, you don't build muscle from your workout. You don't build it from hard work. You don't do it from even pushing your muscles really hard or anything. You build muscle because you create a training stimulus. Okay? That's the entire point of any training session for any goal, including building muscle, is you want to send a signal through your system that says, you've got to make some changes here. Based on the demands that your mind just put on your muscle from the exercise, you got to step up and make some changes. And the only way that ever happens, it's not about your program. It's not about your reps. It's not about your sets. It's not about your tools or your exercises or anything. The only way you can do that is to create progressive muscle tension. You know, when you're telling your muscles, I know this is what you did last time, now step it the F up. I need more reps or I need more weight or I need more range of motion. I need you to somehow just work harder so there's more tension in the muscle and or the same amount of tension for more period of time. That's the only way you've got any chance in hell in creating that stimulus. And once you have that stimulus, then the cascade of changes can happen. Right? Only if you're instructing your muscles with new information, that is your single solitary objective with every workout. And all of these commandments that we have are based around that. Being able to create that means you're embracing your reps, you're not holding yourself back. 
You're working hard because it's going to take damn hard work to be able to uh, have progressive stimulus in your workouts. Simple compound movements. This is one of the, the best ways to make progress. I got a, a question earlier this week from someone saying, how would you quantify single joint exercises in calisthenics, you know, like TRX, bicep curls and stuff? My answer was simple. I wouldn't. You know, I would only quantify the big compound movements that you would have in the strength phase of a grind style workout, because for the most part, your single joint stuff isn't really going to change and progress all that much over the course of several months or even several years. And people who've lifted weights and stuff will probably recognize this. Like if you're doing lateral raises with 10 to 12 pound dumbbells, you're probably going to be using 10 to 12 pound dumbbells in eternity. Uh, when you use single joint exercises, you'll probably make some progress for reps and weight and everything like that for maybe the short term, like maybe a couple of years. But for the most part, people will stick with the same weight and rep range and stuff for the most part with single joint stuff. It's the compound stuff where you're going to make the most uh, meaningful progress the easiest way. Uh, and that's why we use those single compound movements because it's the easiest to make progress on. And then of course, limit sets, because if you're pacing yourself, you're not going to push yourself to that level, or you're going to be pacing yourself and you're going to hold yourself back. And, and even if, it, I mean, progress is like that much in many workouts, it could be the difference between half a rep or hanging onto the bar a little bit longer or a, uh, an inch range more range of motion, but you can lose that if you are not uh, pushing yourself and you're uh, pacing yourself to limit your sets. Okay, so there you go. The first five com uh, commandments for building muscle, not just with calisthenics, but in general, apply this to anything, lifting sandbags and weights and stuff, brace repetitions, work damn hard, use simple compound exercises, as your foundation. Of course, you can use the ISO, uh, the single joint stuff, but it's supplemental. Limit your sets or just focus on those couple of sets that you're going to have your best performance in. And of course, focus on making progress and utilizing a training journal. We'll look at the other five next week uh, and put those more into perspective. But again, the reason why I'm doing this is because a lot of times when we're trying to build muscle, our attention gets pigeonholed or we get blinders into one thing. Like how many reps can I do? Or I'm always lifting to failure or I am getting this many grams of protein per uh, pound of body weight or whatever. This isn't bad, but there's a lot of pieces that have to be in play. And if we're only paying attention to one or two things, we're probably ignoring 90% of the other stuff that's important and you're leaving it completely to chance, therefore your gains. All right, so there's your lesson for this week. Let's start answering some questions. Look at everybody on today. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming on, on in. Uh, Andrea is on, Vic is on, fantastic. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, click to accept a book, you mean Bible, surely. Yes, the Bible of building muscle, CMAS. It really is. I honestly think in many ways CMAS is even better than convict conditioning. Like I personally, I think coach should have started with CMAS and then come out with convict conditioning because it's just the, the fundamental principles that need to be addressed. And the last chapter that they have in that on hormone uh, optimization is just gold. I read it all the time just to keep in mind on how, because ultimately it really is true. Uh, Paul Wade talks about how building muscle really is much more about your hormones than your actual workout. It's kind of like uh, going outside in the hot sun and trying to get a tan. Like your hormones are the intensity of the sun. Now out here in Denver, you can see from my perpetual farmer's tan that I never get rid of, even in the winter, like the sun out here is stuck on the broiler setting. Uh, I go out there for 10 minutes and I feel like I'm frying like an egg on the sidewalk, right? So hormones are incredibly important. I'll cover that in more, more in detail in a, in a future episode, but uh, got me talking, uh, click accept. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's see where we got some questions. Black Dolphin, Matt, am I going too deep into range of motion if my tendons feel sore, not the muscle? Well, I would say it's probably not the range of motion. It's probably something in the muscle isn't doing its job. A lot of times what ends up happening is if a soreness exists in 
a tendon or oftentimes we feel this in the joint, like in the, the elbow or the knees is that's a common one is that a muscle above that or above or below that joint isn't turning on enough. Because remember your tendons are attached to a muscle. So what's happening is uh, in chain training theory, uh, I talk about is the force of the exercise jumps from one muscle to the next kind of like links on a chain You pull on a chain and the force you're pulling through jumps, and transfers from one link to the next. So what ends up happening is it goes from one muscle or link to the next. And if there's a muscle that's not engaged enough, it stops. And the muscle it stopped with is pulling on the tendon saying, okay, come on, go. But all of that force is building in the tendon because it's not jumping to the next muscle. And oftentimes that next muscle is a bigger muscle that should be handling the load. So that's why the tendons are getting overloaded. So it depends on what the tendon is, but look at the muscles, the major muscles above and below that tendon and make sure they're engaging. And oftentimes when we get into a deep range of motion, it's harder to keep a muscle engaged in an elongated position. That's why guys can keep a bicep muscle here but they have trouble tensing their bicep in a like a hanging position on a bar with a straight arm because that mind muscle connection isn't terribly strong. Their tension control can't handle that. So one of the things I would recommend is get into that deep position, but with very little resistance and practice tensing the muscles above and below that joint. So if it's your knee, for example, get into a deep squat, maybe hanging onto something with your hands, like a suspension straps or a, even a post or something, and flex your quads, flex your glutes, flex your hamstrings, flex your quads, get everything engaged. And when you engage the right muscle, that tension or that stress in the tendon should disappear pretty darn fast because now you're literally releasing the stress into the other muscles it's like releasing the dam you kind of thing the force going through the joint is perfectly fine our joints can handle a ton of stress it's when that stress doesn't go through the joint but into the joint that causes uh problems all right hopefully that helps that can be a that could be something that takes time uh to learn too it's like what's engaging what's not engaging shift work in grind style calisthenics is really good for that too. Uh, with the shifting work that we have in the second phase of the grind style workouts, it's really good for helping to learn what muscles are working uh, on and off and uh, things that uh, didn't quite engage. YouTube, <laughs> I did dips and pull-ups e earlier today. 303,500 calories. Is that total? Or is that uh, also with some cardio? What else are you doing? Plus, what are you judging it off of? Always remember, my friends, that calorie counts and expenditure are estimated uh, at best, but they are a good thing to get a target on. Uh, I always tell clients and stuff, like, I don't care what the number is. I care where the number goes. <laughs> like if it says you burned 1,000 calories and then it says you burned 1,500 calories, well, we don't know if that's really accurate or not, but there's a good bet that you burn 50% more calories. So you're on the right track. That's good. It's always more about more or less rather than what the actual uh, number. All right. Let's see. Steve French is progressing in pull-ups by doing five sets of five reps when your max single set is 15, then adding two to three reps per set, going from five by five, four to five, one by seven, and so on with low intensity. It's not a bad strategy. I would say though, if you're looking at like a five by five, I would go with a progressive technique or added weight. So that way it's a little bit more on the heavier side of things. Now, what you're doing here is actually a really good strategy. This kind of goes in par with um, Coach Dan John's Easy Strength. If you haven't checked out Easy Strength, check that out. Very different approach, uh, kind of a grease the groove format when it comes to strength training, but this is kind of along those lines. You're basically practicing the movement. Whenever we practice our movement, we get better at it. We're gonna get stronger at it because after all, strength is a skill. So I think what you're doing is fine. And as always, experiment and see what happens with it. That's the best way to always learn information. But going with something like that is not at all bad. It's a good progressive strategy. Highly recommend it. Give it a shot. Listen to your body. And as always, if you feel like you're running yourself down, give yourself extra rest. All right. Michael Greenberg, always good to see you, my friend. How have you been? What would be your number one or two muscle building leg exercises for those with very restricted ankle mobility? Fantastic. Well, this is another reason why I'm a big fan of using upper body support with the classic uh, exercises from calisthenics like pistol squats, 
shrimp squats are another one. Uh, Bulgarian split squats, where your back leg is up on an elevated surface. Of course, you can add weight to any of these exercises. That's a very good way to go about it. Um, but basically the basic compound movements of squat variants, lunges and stuff like that, but focus on getting that ankle mobility as much as possible in every exercise. Like don't accept that for what it is and be like, well, I guess I just don't have good ankle mobility. Like treat every single leg exercise you ever do as an ankle mobility exercise. So you're pushing your knee forward, getting that shin to go forward, keeping tension in those shins, in those calf muscles and hamstrings, especially because the best way to build mobility is to do strength exercises that require that mobility. In that case, it could be any compound movement you like. So I would say for now, choose a compound leg exercise that feels strong to you, feels stable, doesn't feel like ah, kind of thing. So whatever that would be, but allows you to get deep and allows your knee to really kind of go forward, keeping tension in the quads, hamstrings and calves, and your ankle mobility will improve uh, with practice pretty quickly. Uh, good qu classic question, Wesley Baptista, when to change my workout? Whenever you want, really. <laughs> whenever you feel like it, uh, change it whenever things are starting to feel stale. I'm not a big, this kind of goes along with what I was saying earlier of, I'm not a big fan of giving people like a number structure, like do these many sets, do these many reps. Like there's so many nuances that can influence how much of something you should or should not be doing. Same thing with your workout. One of the biggest mistakes I see people making is they're doing great in their workout. They're going like gangbusters. They're making progress. They're excited about what they're doing. And then they just change it up because it's four weeks has gone by or because they got the latest arm workout or whatever. It's like, what? No, like the number one rule of a good game plan is don't change the plan when you're making progress. If you're making progress and you're going forward, stay with it. Keep going. Milk that sucker for everything it's worth. But once things start to slow down, primarily it doesn't feel like it's a, you're learning anything from the workout and it's starting to feel stale. I like to use that term. It's like stale bread. You know, you get fresh bread right out of the oven. You're like, oh, this is good. And then you get stale bread and you're like, eh, whatever. I'm just kind of eating it for the sake of eating it, right? You want the same thing for your workouts. If it starts feeling stale mentally, stale in your nervous system and stuff, now start to change it. Now, the biggest recommendation I give you though is when you change it, don't change different exercises, but keep the same type of training. That's the mistake I used to make. I would be like doing dumbbell bench press, three sets of 10. And they're like, okay, time to change it up. And then I'd go to the weight machine bench press, but it'd still be three sets of 10. <laughs> like a little bit different with a different machine, but essentially because what I was doing was a roughly the same, the stimulus was roughly the same. So change speed, change repetitions, change range of motion, change something about how you're doing the exercise. You can even use the exact same thing. So I would have been smarter to stick with dumbbell bench press and instead gone with higher reps or much lower reps. So if I was doing like a three by 10, go with a five by five. That's gonna tell the muscles new information and give a new stimulus and make it feel live and refreshed and get you going in the right direction rather than just changing random exercises all of the time. Fantastic exercise. Thank you for the opportunity to answer that. Hope that was of value. Julian Harris, how do I balance my judo training and my muscle building? How do I incorporate kettlebells into my routines without overdoing it? P.S. about NOS straps, fantastic, well done. NOSC, definitely the number one suspension strap system that I highly recommend, I use them myself. And again, there's a link down below in the description if you wanna check those out. Uh, but uh, all about balance here. Now, naturally you're gonna run against the limitations of time and energy. You only have so much time and so much energy to be doing things. So what I would do is make a list of which of these is most important to you. Judo, building muscle, and well, kettlebells we can incorporate and stuff like that. So which is more important? So that's where you're gonna put 75 percentage of your time, right? And we can always change things up. You could be like, I'm gonna focus on judo in the summer and muscle building supplemental, and then come winter, you can switch it up and stuff. So nothing's set in stone, but I would say which is more important. And I would focus on the most important thing three days a week or four, depending on how you split things up. And the other is twice a week. 
Okay, how much energy is it taking uh, from you? And that's what I would go with, right? Now, kettlebells, uh, basically, like I was saying earlier, movement patterns. Just swap out the exercises for the movement pattern. So a lot of kettlebell stuff is hip hinge movement or extension chain here in grind style calisthenics speak. So I would simply say instead of doing body weight or you know weight machine versions of hip hinge movements, you have kettlebell movements instead. So if I said, I don't want to do bridges today, I'm going to do kettlebell swings or kettlebell snatches. Great. It's the same basic movement pattern, same basic uh, tension chain. So you're working the same muscles, just a different vehicle. That's all you're doing. You can be like, okay, kettlebells instead. Overhead press, right? Handstand, interchangeable, same movement uh, pattern, same tension chain. So as long as the movement pattern is roughly the same, you can switch and swap and mix and match however you like, depending on what resources you have and what your preferences are for the day. That's the way I would go about it. Uh, good luck with those NOSC straps. Let me know if you have any questions, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. All right, Nicholas, hey Matt, how do I keep from falling on my butt when doing one-legged squat? Like I said earlier, upper body support, use upper body support. The great thing about upper body support is you can progress and regress the amount of support you have from your hands mid-set and even mid-repetition. So I would grab onto something, two hands, like a post or a, a barbell and a rack or something, start doing your squats and learn to pull yourself forward. Because remember, squats have a pulling component to it. Muscles in your shins, your hamstrings for your knee flexors and your hip flexors, uh, which your quads are one of them, because you should feel like you're pulling yourself forward into the squat, right? And your arms can supplement that. And as your leg gets stronger in that pulling movement, you can use less and less and less just one hand and then your fingertips and less with your uh, upper body. Uh, and that way you're progressing your ability to pull into the squat from going from your arms to your legs. That's how I would go about it. Good question, Nicholas. Flynn, quick question. Love that avatar, man. Love the uh, uh, Pink Floyd reference. Uh, not fitness related, but how come your videos are only in 360p rather and full HD like they used to? That's a very good question. I'll have to look into that. Now with these live ones, that may be due to the software that I'm using. I'll see if there's a setting that I can improve upon that. Uh, I know it's a little grainier here. My lighting needs to improve uh, to a degree. I need to get some more lights here and stuff, but I think it's due to the software that I'm using. I'm using a program here called StreamYard. Uh, believe it or not, I am not a techie. I don't know technology worth anything. When I started to get interested in the streaming stuff, I no joke, it took me six weeks and I was just on YouTube videos and like, how do I stream? How do I, like nothing is just push the button and go uh, that I could find, but StreamYard does that. So uh, it may be in there, but uh, thanks for mentioning that. I'll look into it. All right, Jake Schutzel. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Right there, Jake. Matt, when I do push-ups, I always get a strange sensation in my left shoulder, uh, up and upper back. My left pec never gets sore either. Any questions? Yeah, you're probably elevating your shoulder. That's probably what's going on. Your shoulder is up and it may be slightly protracted as well. So pull it back and down, especially in the bottom position. Think of uh, the way I, I teach people this is think of stretching the line between the point of your shoulder and your nipple. Like when you go into the bottom position, you should feel like you're stretching that line across like this. If you're here, right, that's too close. And that's my, my chest is just nothing. This is what I call the off position. It's all in the joint. It's hardly in the muscle. Come back here, squeezing. Now it's going right into the chest. That's probably what's going on. Uh, keep me posted and updated on your progress there. Hassan. Is it okay to train four days in a row if you are working different muscle groups? Sure, of course, uh, like push, pull, legs, and so on. Yeah, ab absolutely, that's a classic split. A lot of people have done that in the past. Remember, you can always train whatever the hell you like because you never have to recover from exercise. You never have to recover from training. You have to recover from fatigue. So that's the thing that we're always basing things off of, like things that don't require, uh, don't create a lot of fatigue, don't require much recovery. If any recovery. Things that create more fatigue require more recovery. So you can do any kind of workout you like. You can do whatever because keep in mind that things are going to be changing. Sometimes you'll do a workout and uh, it's going to be fresh as a daisy two days later. Other areas you might like go for a run and 
still have trouble uh, climbing a flight of stairs three days after. It's like keep the uh, legs off. That's why I go with a very flexible approach. I work my muscles when they are ready to be worked. I don't have a weekly structure to my training routine. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out Red Delta Project's uh, channel on the uh, and search for flexible training or intuitive training uh, for that. And I can talk more about that in uh, future videos as well. These are awesome questions. You guys are really coming through uh, this week. Holy smokes. It's fantastic. Uh, I hope I am answering these to your satisfaction. Uh, Jackman, what do you think about no negative pistol squats? So just up from the bottom. Yeah, not bad. Uh, exercise, dynamic exercise. You're always going to be better off with both eccentric and concentric. I know there's a lot of methods out there that are eccentric only, like slowly lowering down from a pull-up position. Uh, right now in the workout at my gym uh, that we're teaching, we have slow eccentric pistol squats of all things. And there's a good place for that if eccentric. Eccentric's a good thing to do if you can't do concentric. But when you're talking about concentric only, um, I'm kind of guessing, I'm questioning why. Like if no eccentric, maybe less stress getting out of the bottom position uh, would be one thing, in which case you may just want to put a pause. Bottom, I'm, I'm overthinking this one. Uh, bottom line is, yeah, they're fine. They're great. But you are missing out by not having the eccentric. So practice it for, I would say, practice it for three weeks and see what you get out of it. What are the benefits to it? What do you find yourself having? Then test it with regular dynamic pistol squats and see if that carries over better or worse or what the experience is. It's a good question. I've never not really run into too many people looking at concentric only repetitions. Usually it's eccentric only, and uh, that's a different story. Awesome question, very good. Max Covers, how many times a week do you recommend working each muscle? Also, do you think reps and sets are better or to failure? Either way, um, I again, I don't really have a, a number that I follow. Like I will hit a uh, muscle two, three, four, once, you know, it's all totally down to how my muscles are feeling. I train them and I work them when they are ready to be worked and trained. And so if they're feeling tired, feeling fatigued, I'm having an off day, I'll leave it off to the next day. I'm a big fan of putting off my workouts for a better time. It's like, and choosing to fight the battle when you know you can win. So it really depends on a million things. You know, usually the good recommendation is two to three times per uh, week is a good place to start. Most people will be fine just with that. I'm sure I'm falling within that range myself with my freestyles approaches to training, but uh, that's a good place to start. But, you know, if you want to do like a grease the groove and get one pull up every time you go under your pull up bar, sure, every day, you know, you use the easy strength program from Dan John that I talked about earlier. That's five days a week, uh, same exercises uh, kind of approach. So it depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it, of course. But remember, we base our recovery time off of fatigue, not just some arbitrary number. And when it comes to set reps and sets, better to failure. Uh, I don't put a lot of stock into failure. As I was saying earlier, like, yeah, push yourself as hard as you can. Just go for it. But you don't necessarily, I know this is a mistake I made where I would be like, yeah, I'm going to failure. It's like, so? Like, you don't tell your body anything by going to failure. You tell your body to change by telling it to do more than before. So if you do three sets of 10, or let's say you do 10 push-ups, and you're going to failure every time, you're not telling your body anything new. It's still the same sets of 10. So even though you're going to failure, you're still working as hard as you can, nothing's going to change because your training hasn't changed. So if you are saying, well, I do this many sets, but the repetitions are increasing or I'm adding resistance in uh, several different ways, now you go. Whether or not you're going to failure, I think is a... Uh, secondary sort of thing. So the focus on progressing your performance is more important for your overall results than the actual failure. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping around here a little bit. I just uh, double checked things. Michael Greenberg, what are some key points to get the most out of the grind style calisthenics dip push chain uh, hold progression? So this is level four, I believe, where you're just on the rings or the straps and you're just holding yourself up. 
So when you're doing that, what you want to do is use total body tension first and foremost. It is a push chain, yes, but you want to make sure you have your toes pulled up, shins are engaged, quads are engaged, abs are engaged, feet are ever so slightly in front of you. Uh, so that way you have a little tiny bit of a posterior tilt in your pelvis, that hollow body hold sometimes. Shoulders are back, chest is up, looking forwards, arms are turned in and squeeze in towards your sides like crazy. Now a good rule of thumb for that is you should feel that almost equally in your lats and your chest when you're holding up on a dip like that because you want to hold yourself up with both your pectorals and your lats. If you feel like it's all in your chest, you may be hunching forward a little bit on that one. So feel like you're kind of pulling back and getting some good supportive tension in your lats. Good, 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 good question there, Michael. Let's answer just a few more questions here. I got some salmon on the grill. Call him my name. Uh, let's see. Sammy, I always have muscle soreness only left side when I do compound exercises. Is this normal? It, it's not terribly unheard of. Uh, we all have our differences and discrepancies between the right and left side. So to feel it more on one side than the other isn't uh, too abnormal. Could be a couple things though that you wanna pay attention to. One is you could just have that side as weaker and it's catching up to the other side. So if that's the case, keep on keeping on and it will get bigger and stronger and those muscles will balance out and it'll be fine and you won't have to deal with it anymore. But the other way to think about that is that there could be a technical or tension discrepancy between one side and the other. So the sore side that's not getting sore might not be working as effectively as possible. So that side is carrying more of the load. And the other one, like I was saying earlier, your shoulders just a little bit out of alignment, your arms in different position, just some smallest little technical detail can make all the difference. So I would record yourself uh, with a video of the exercises in question and see if you can notice any discrepancies in your technique or just how the muscles feel during the exercise that may be contributing that and see if you can get it to kind of balance out. All right, fitness emergency. What is better to get biceps volume to work out in with uh, Z-bar with exercise, preacher curl, or do chin-ups. Either way, either way can work perfectly well, of course. Uh, remember, biceps, like all muscles, are very simple. You know, they have an origin and an insertion, and they work to bring the two closer together. The actual exercise you're doing is largely irrelevant. Now, you may feel like you can get more engagement from some exercises, in which case you'll probably get better results from that. But what I would do, if I were you, is do uh, each exercise, see how it feels in the bicep for each one, and work on trying to get it to feel exactly the same either way. That's what you really want because oftentimes when we change something in our technique, uh, our brain creates a difference in our its perception. It's not actually a real difference in how the muscle is working. It's a perception of the exercise is different. And therefore we're creating a different tension pattern. It's kind of like when it's a psychosomatic thing, like when little kids back in the day, like I used to swear that Skittles, M&Ms and Reese's Pieces all tasted exactly the same. Because to me, they all look the same, so they're all exactly the same, right? But at, at the same time, some kids will be like, brown M&Ms taste better than green M&Ms. We're not creating a, there's no real difference. We're creating a difference in our perception. So when it comes to exercises like this, I'm always encouraging people, have the feeling in the muscle match from exercise to the next almost exactly the same. That's how we really get good tension control in the muscles and we have the maximum amount of stability from one exercise to the next. So anything pulling, you should feel almost exactly the same. Anything pushing should feel almost exactly the same in the muscles. Granted, there's always gonna be some difference in the flavor naturally, but uh, I would say try to get it to not be different as much as possible and you'll have much better results overall. Ah, another good question asking about the poster in the back from Max Stewart. This came from Japan. I got this when I was 17. I went and did my first trip to Japan and I bought this in Kyoto. I just thought it looked cool too. Always liked the red and black, you know, of course. And uh, it's this is like one of those things that uh, just has followed me throughout life. Like everywhere I've lived, every apartment and everything has always been uh, with that somewhere in a prominent place just because I like it. I probably should... Uh, get a better frame for it or something like that. It's uh, it's getting quite old and a bit ratty. All right, last question coming from the man, Michael, drop weight daddy. Do you prefer larger diameter grips, 
You know, suspended trainers are smaller grip diameter, very good, especially for you DIY folks out there building your own. I've got a ton of DIY suspension strap uh, videos on the channel. Just search literally DIY and you'll get everything. I also have a playlist of DIY videos and reviews for uh, suspension straps, other equipment. I've been putting a lot of stuff out there lately and I've got a lot more coming. Anyway, Michael, good question. I always prefer bigger uh, because my hands are a good size. I just seem to have a bit, and it's not so much my fingers, but my palm seems to be a bit of the bigger side. So I've always much preferred big, thick, beefy grips. One of my personal things is that no one makes the handle thick enough on classic or traditional equipment like barbells. They're too skinny. Uh, dumbbells are usually too skinny, although these days a lot of dumbbell manufacturers are getting their grips to be bigger, especially with bigger, the heavier weights. It's one of the reasons why I always felt better using kettlebells. Like I want a big honking beefy grip, uh, something that I can barely get my fingers around is what I feel most comfortable with. Otherwise, it's just too much pressure point. It's just uncomfortable for me. All right, cool fan. Do you see any point in training at odd angles or through extreme ranges of motion? Of course, that's what my uh, shifting phase in grind style calisthenics is all about. Put yourself in weird angles and go through a big range of motion. Build stability, builds mobility, builds integrity in joints, keeps uh, your body bulletproof. Tons of value for that. Uh, whether you're doing shifting work like in grind style calisthenics, things like Mike Fitch's Animal Flow um, of the Elements program from Gold Metal uh, Body Fitness is also very good. They've got a lot of great stuff with that. Check out their YouTube channel for some ideas. Fantastic. We all could do more of that sort of exercise for sure. Great questions keep coming in. I know I said that was the last one, uh, but awesome, awesome. Cardinals fan, fantastic. How are the Cardinals playing this year? I haven't checked them out. Uh, haven't been paying too much attention to it. Of course, it is three games in the season. But is it possible for bulk up and growing any muscle with only just a home workout? Of course, yeah, your muscles don't care if you're home or at the gym or at the park or on the moon. Uh, anything that makes your muscles work progressively harder will work. All the other details are just that details. All right. Last question. I promise, Sam, would you still recommend TMR 3.0 since exploring chain training for building muscle? So TMR 3.0, go to reddeltaproject.com. That's one of my many free eBooks, Triad Muscle Revolution. It's the first eBook program that I ever created. Basically the most simple, straightforward way to build muscle and strength with calisthenics. Three main movement patterns, basically push, pull, and squat. The best, most straightforward way. And Grand Style Calisthenics is largely based off of that as well. Uh, so yes, still highly recommend it. Otherwise, I'd take the book down. The book is still there and I'm still recommending people read it and I'm still recommending people put it to use because it is by far one of the simplest body weight style approaches to building muscle out there, period. All right, folks, there you go. Thank you so much for coming on. We had a great group today, great questions. Thank you so much. I do this every Wednesday, remember, uh, roughly around 6.30, 7 o'clock here in uh, Denver time here in Colorado. Sincerely appreciate it. And uh, I've got a lot more stuff coming. Don't forget next week, I'll be talking about the second part, five commandments for building muscle with calisthenics or just building muscle in period. So go over those five that I just listed. See if you're missing any of those or one of those you can work on and let the gains begin. I'll talk to you guys next week. Till then be fit, live free.